Hello, welcome to Molecular Biology Review. I'm your host, Ryder, and this week we'll be checking out a paper called Applying CRISPR-Cas9 Tools to Identify and Characterize Transcriptional Enhancers. Uh, it's published, authored by Rui Lopez, Gozde Korkmaz, and Ruben Agami. Uh, now this one is a review. I usually don't do reviews, but uh, I didn't really notice this paper was a review until I got it home. So uh, it was published in Nature Reviews uh, Molecular and Cell Biology, and it's quite interesting. So let me take you through it. I will say this video is appropriate for an undergraduate or graduate level. Uh, but I may go a little bit fast, so in that case, it might be a graduate level. But please, I encourage you to check out the paper. Uh, you can access it through a university network. Maybe you can find some bootleg copies online, but I'll put the link in the description for you. Let's get right into it. Uh, there's not very many figures in this one, so instead of going by figures, I'll just take you through the entire paper. So, first of all, CRISPR and Cas9, I'm sure you've heard of it, and um, it's fairly simple, so I won't really uh, agonize too long on the details. But, basically, it's an RNA-targeted nuclease enzyme. The CRISPR is the genomic element, the Cas9 is the protein. CRISPR is a type of uh, interspersed repeat first found in viruses, basically the enzyme gets targeted by a small RNA of 23 to 25 nucleotides. Once it reaches the target, it will then introduce a double strand break, which is obviously very uh, handy if you want to do genome editing. How can you use Cas9 to study enhancers? I guess I should note quickly what is an enhancer. You've probably heard of a promoter element, which is the element immediately upstream of the initiation site of a gene where to which RNA polymerase can bind. Almost said DNA polymerase. RNA polymerase can bind and commence transcription of a gene. That's the promoter. The enhancer is not the promoter. The enhancer is often many base pairs upstream of the start site and it's another element which increases polymerase binding and transcription. How can you activate enhancer elements with CRISPR? The way they see it, you use a nuclease deactivated Cas9, so it would just be an enzyme that gets targeted by its guide RNA, which is still very useful but it will not induce a double strand break. Instead, uh, they use a fusion protein. Uh, so they engineer a protein with you know two domains in it where it's either fused with VP64, I imagine that's a viral protein 64, or uh, some other kind of, what is it, P65. And basically, these are just transactivator domains. So your Cas9 will come, be targeted specifically to the gene, and then bind and initiate transcription. So when you activate an enhancer with Cas9, it's apparently called CRISPR-A for activation. When you repress something with uh, an enhancer element with CRISPR, it's called CRISPR-I, just like RNAi, CRISPR interference. What do they do? They use the dead Cas9, nucleus dead Cas9, um, and they just block polymerase elongation. So I guess that's one way to do it. You just have your nucleus dead enzyme, specifically binds to a certain region in your suspected enhancer zone, and uh, you can see if it blocks transcription or not. Some of the most common histone epigenetic modifications around enhancers or promoters are histone three, Lysine 4 gets monomethylated and lysine 27 gets acetylated in enhancers apparently and these regions are also depleted of nucleosomes which I find interesting and in promoters lysine 4 is trimethylated and lysine 27 is still acetylated so 
I guess these correlate with uh, enhancers and promoters. That's kind of interesting. Of course, you could read this out by chip seek chromatin immunoprecipitation and sequencing. So it's an easy way to read out epigenetic marks. Just a bit of a side note here. There's three techniques that they mentioned that I've never heard of in my entire life. Uh, Chia Pet which is chromatin interaction analysis with paired end tagging. Uh, 3C, which is chromosome confirmation capture. And GrowSeq, which is global run-on sequencing. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you guys a favor. If any of you are familiar with these techniques, please make a video response, just a short video or whatever, letting me know that someone uses these. Thanks a lot. All right, but aside from all these epigenetic uh, ramblings, let's talk about actual enhancers. So they, they, note, they note this, and you know this is what I've always imagined as what an enhancer is. It's the ability to increase transcription from a minimal promoter in some kind of reporter vector. So usually when you use a vector, a plasmid or whatever, it contains just a very basic simple promoter such as you know CMV promoter or I don't even know, what's the other one called, T7 promoter. And then if you would, you know, clone into that vector an enhancer, it would then increase the expression of your gene by any kind of reporter that uh, you want to read out, like, I guess, luciferase or something. And they know, you know, uh, quite intelligently that the epigenetic status of a region is not identical to enhancer activity. But here they say, they try to justify it by saying, oh, there's mostly owing to the use of, you know, like... They just put an arbitrary cutoff on, on, their, on their epigenetic marks. Honestly, I think that there's not going to be any kind of global you know, trend of epigenetic marks directly correlating to enhancer activity. There's just too many different transcription factors in the, in the genome. I imagine each one has, each family at least of proteins probably has their totally own correlations uh, of epigenetic marks. And so, for example, this is what they say. By epigenetics, they, they, they estimate that there are 1 million enhancers in the human genome. However, only 40,000, which is like, what, 4%, 4 to 6% of any of these enhancers have actually ever been verified uh, with some kind of functional reporter assay. Oh, and they also raise the point that, wow, they discovered a whole new class of elements called unmarked regulatory elements. And these are just any element, enhancer element, that isn't epigenetically modified. Which isn't surprising. You know, DNA itself is already a code. Transcription factor can just bind to DNA. Anyway, so we talked about activating CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I. But those are both using, actually, nuclease dead enzymes. Now let's talk about genetic manipulation of enhancers, i.e. indels. Oh, by the way, uh, if you don't know about the word indels, you got to learn this word right now. It's a very useful word. It just means insertion and or deletion. All right, so this is probably what you're used to hearing about CRISPR. Since it's a nuclease, it introduces a double-strand break, and this can be used to either insert or delete genomic elements. The first way, I guess, is you just make a single NIC, or I mean a single double-strand break, and then the cell's genetic machinery repairs this NIC and it inserts random nucleotides which can can interfere with some kind of, you know, it could create a frame shift, for example, or interfere with the uh, TF binding site. Uh, the other way to genetically modify would be to use two, two double-strand breaks on either end of your, uh, of your element, so kind of like a restriction digest or something like that. Uh, so... Apparently both of them have been used already for enhancer uh, analysis, but they do mention that the double nickase strategy is a good one, and I actually know some, some people in my own lab use the double nickase strategy, and it seems to be very effective. How do you determine whether a certain stretch of DNA is an enhancer? Well, it's actually very similar. Even though you're using CRISPR and Cas9, a very sophisticated technology, this the strategy is exactly the same as they've been doing since you know the 80s. 
you, you see these papers where they've got, you know, a large promoter region, and they have different uh, clones that cover the entire promoter region, and then they either, you know, just transform each of these into a reporter and see what happens. You know, the same thing can be done with proteins. If you're wondering which, you know, amino acids are are important for a protein's function, you can you can sequentially delete. You can make a bunch of different modifications of the protein, and each one just lacks a, a small little bit. That way, you make kind of like a map of 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 which parts of the the, the protein or DNA are are essential. All right, so this is what they call a tiling screen. So that's exactly what they do. They they make well, they say hundreds of different small guide RNAs. Remember, those are the little RNAs that direct CRISPR uh, Cas9 enzyme to its target. You tile lots of them over your your enhancer region, and then you'll just see which of these, when 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 Cas9 nicks the DNA, which of them causes a massive de decrease in transcription. So for me, that's probably you know the the core. Um, use of CRISPR-Cas9 enhancer studies, and they they've said that actually this has already been used has already been used to identify uh, enhancers in several genes. For example, GATA2 uh, and SOX2. So uh, at least two genes have already been studied by this this tiling technique, and it seems to work well. Another thing I like to discuss is. Ev uh, directly modifying the epigenetic state of an enhancer. So even though I don't believe too much that there's some kind of huge correlation between lysine methylation and enhancer activity, I do think it would be very useful to have a tool for specifically either methylating or demethylating a certain region of DNA. So what they do is they make a fusion of the dead Cas9 with a, an enzyme called LSD1, that's the demethylase, lysine-specific demethylase, or you could use the DCAS9 with an acetylating enzyme called P300. So basically you could study a site by doing that, target your, your enzyme to that, and then have it fused to a, a methylating, acetylating, or you know whatever kind of enzyme to alter the epigenetic state of your zone. Okay, probably running out of time here. One final, I guess, interesting part they they uh, they bring up is that they could also manipulate higher order chromatin organization. They've actually made some kind of, actually it was with a zinc finger nuclease, so not quite CRISPR, but same idea. They had a fusion where they could actually force, like, enhance chromatin looping by uh, fusing a zinc finger nucleus to some kind of chromatin, you know, looping protein. And basically what they did was they were able to activate genes that were silenced by, by heterochromatin. And they also saw that, uh, you know, they also saw that when you disrupt these topological boundaries between hetero and euchromatin with a Cas9 uh, double strand break, it, it also resulted in some pretty major chromatin changes and it, it uh, it activated gene expression, so I guess that's a little tidbit for all you uh, topological boundary people. I know you're out there. All right, so yeah, basically what they say is you can, if you use a uh, nuclease dead Cas9, you can then use some kind of scaffold protein that is capable of uh, causing DNA looping or kind of regrouping different DNA elements. So uh, I think that would be really useful. You know, there's some cell types, for example, neutrophils which are just terminally differentiated and it's very hard to get any kind of gene editing out of them. So this might be a good way to kind of probe why the chromatin is so condensed. All right, let us read the summary. To summarize, the development of the CRISPR-Cas9 system triggered a revolution in the field of genome engineering. Initially, the use of the system was focused on the study of protein-coding genes, but recently, a number of CRISPR-Cas9-based tools have been developed to study non-coding transcriptional regulatory elements. Yeah, a lot better than the so-called ENCODE consortium, eh? These technological advances offer unprecedented opportunities for elucidating the functions of enhancers in their endogenous context. Here, we discuss the application, current limitations, and future development of CRISPR-Cas9 systems to identify and characterize enhancer elements in a high-throughput manner. 
So the take home message is uh, go use CRISPR to study enhancers. It's very easy. You can do screening, high throughput with it, and just don't study epigenetics, okay? See you next time.